So we'll wait for like one or two minutes and start. We are yeah, ready. Yeah, yeah. Sure, sure, sure. Absolutely, absolutely. As is convenient. How long would the seminar be generally? I mean, how long are you looking at? One and a half, two hours. So like including the questions. Okay. Absolutely, absolutely. No problem. Okay, so let's start. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Exoticon, a web guide on care and management of exotic pets. I'm Zid Cheda, Animal Welfare Head of IVSA India. IVSA, the International Veterinary Student Association, is the world's largest vet student association. IVSA India is the national member organization of IVSA Global. The Animal Welfare team of IVSA India has representatives from all the member organizations from our country. We started this team to speak about the topic that is welfare of animals, which is very little known, and to create awareness about it. Make sure you check out our former projects on farm animal welfare and a poster series on their laws on our Instagram page that is at the rate IBS India. We are very excited to have you all on board today, where we shall learn about the care, management, nutrition, and about various aspects of our fluffy and feathery friends. Over to you, Sam. Hi everyone, I'm Samitha Reddy from IVSA Bangalore. Uh, today I take great pride in introducing our speaker, Mr. Nandakishore Reddy. Uh, we are very happy to have you here, sir. After graduating with a master's degree in biotechnology, he has worked extensively in the field of tissue culture, but his passion for animals and birds made him quit his job and pursue the hobby of bird keeping. His mother, who had budgies as a child, was an avid uh, bird lover, and she was the one who inspired him to like become an agriculturist. He's also the founder of uh, Raga Foundation, which funds a number of conservation projects. He, his work on standardization protocols for corn use and macaws have made him a prominent speaker in a number of con uh, conventions held in India, Australia, and Europe. Not only have a number of articles have been written about him in various print media and digital media, 
His work has also been recognized by the Avian Society of India. He has received a number of awards and he's been the guest speaker. Um, and the, he's also a consultant for a number of zoological parks and the Forest Department of India. Apart from all of this, he's also a part of a non-profit, non-governmental organization called Animal Rehabilitation and Protection Front. This is a student-run organization. It works for the rejuvenation of uh, forests and protection of endemic wildlife. Um, thank you, sir, for joining us today. Um, I'd also like to take a minute to talk about uh, SEVA, which is called as Students' Endeavor for uh, Welfare of Animals. It is a little campaign by the IVSA India, which is uh, for public funding. So I'm going to talk more about this. SEVA, as it translates in Hindi, means selfless service. And uh, every time we choose one uh, student from IVSA, a member, who goes out of his or her way to help animals, especially during the pandemic, they've been feeding or treating the animals or even, uh, giving them health care and shelter as well. So they're, uh, they're doing this all by themselves without any support. So um, this time we've chosen uh, Spruha. Spruha is a member from IVSA Bida. And uh, please make sure you check out her video right now. And <coughs> I'm Spriha. I'm studying in third year at Veterinary College, Peter. Ever since I was a little kid, I was always so passionate about helping animals in any way possible. But back then, the most I could do was give them a packet of biscuits. <laughs> but right now, I do have a wider perspective of how I can help these animals. The colony where I live in has around 50 dogs. And until now, I did manage to get 15 dogs neutered. I know it's not a great number, but the fact that we need to put money from our own pockets, and since Blue Cross costs around 1500 rupees for a dog, it does get a little expensive. This chunky dog right here is Hazel, one of the dogs we can for neutering. And she loves to party like there's no tomorrow. I also participate in rescues in my colony. I have helped <coughs> with cases that range from um, fever till most used to being a December case. This is Jason, who was found with a broken limb from a car accident. He was treated and found a forever home where he is now showered with lots of affection. Lila was a distemper survivor who also fought TVT. She was taken to the hospital and got the necessary treatment and she is now better than ever. The distemper drama in the month of September was the most expensive and consuming. My mother was showing nervous symptoms pertaining to the canine distemper virus, so she was taken immediately to the Canfil Pit Clinic and the doctor over there advised us to give her a minimum of four shots of the anti-distemper serum. Since each dose costed more than 4,000 rupees, we spread around the word of donations and the response we got was huge. And she got all the necessary treatment and now is a proud survivor. I even try going around and feeding as many dogs as I can in my colony and around the area. There are many, many stories that I could tell, but then it would just take a lot of time. The medical bills sometimes are just too much and touch the roof. So help in the form of funds or donations. It can just let me do much more than what I can do right now. I can get more dogs neutered and help many more dogs get treated in a much better way. Feed more dogs in my colony and definitely try to vaccinate as many dogs as I can. 
I would like to thank IVC India for giving me this wonderful opportunity. Thank you. We request you to contribute to Spruha's initiative. Any help would be appreciated. Her account details will be linked in the comment section below. Make sure you check that out. Now, without any further ado, let's start with our webinar. Over to you, Nandakishwar sir. So you are on mute. Okay. <laughs> So I'm technically very challenged, so I apologize for that. But uh, yeah, uh, firstly, I'd, uh, uh, what IVSA is doing is fantastic with SEVA. Uh, I've always believed that, I mean, I run an NGO and uh, called Raga Foundation, but then uh, we don't uh, beg for CSR because I feel that corporate social responsibility uh, is not the only way that NGOs can survive. There's something called civic social responsibility, which you and I are also part of. This is our world and we have to take care of them and uh, of our world. And it's very important that people understand that and you know, contribute and do whatever is best. So I wish you all the very best. And I'll start off with uh, my uh, seminar. And if there is anything that uh, anybody wants to question me and things that I maybe after the seminar, I'll uh, I'll open up the answer and uh, question and answer round. And uh, if there's anything else, maybe uh, you can stop me and ask also. Okay. So the first uh, and the foremost important thing is uh, I'd like to talk about Wildlife Protection Act. It is uh, formed in 1972 and it has not been uh, amended since then. They were planning to amend it a little bit. Uh, in the recent past, but I don't know if it would happen. But however, the crux of the act is that uh, anything that is indigenous to India or which is migratory in nature, that is any animal, plant or insect found in India, or if it is migrating into the country, cannot be kept in captivity. It is considered government property. So if you have a, a crow or a peacock or a, um, a tiger or whatever in captivity, you are no, technically you are actually, uh, it is government property that you're withholding. So it is a criminal act. Anything that is not found in India can be kept as a pet. So if tomorrow you want to have a orangutan or a hippopotamus or uh, I don't know, cheetahs, no, you can have them. There's no problem. It is just that uh, in the recent past, uh, there were a lot of uh, questions about the legality of the animal from where did it come. Was it poached? Did it uh, cross the border without any permit and things like that? But in the recent past, there have been declarations also. So uh, till December 15th of uh, 2020, we have the declaration. So you can voluntarily disclose, disclose whatever animals you have. So for example, we have ball pythons, we have sugar gliders, we have hedgehogs, we have a number of birds, we have you know all kinds of pets. So we, we're disclosing all of them. and. Uh, uh, Ministry for Environment and Forest is going to give us ownership documentation. So uh, when you as veterinarians, when you are handling uh, animals, you need to understand that there is uh, a clear demarcation between what is exotic and what is non-exotic. Uh, and unfortunately, a lot of people are not aware of uh, this demarcation or, or even the species that are there. Like very recently, we had somebody who came to our aviary uh, in the in the foundation in the NGO, and then they said we have some finches which we want to release, and we can't take care of them. And then it turns out that there were strawberry finches, you know, and uh, <clears throat> uh, spice finches or scaly breasted munias. So uh, people are not aware of the law. So this is what, <coughs> excuse me, uh, Wildlife Protection Act, 1972 states. Okay, uh, I hope it is clear. Uh, and then. So once you've once you've understood the demarcation of what is a, what is legally allowed to be kept and what is illegal to be kept, we can go into what is legally uh, pets that can legally be kept, okay, as uh, as pets, okay. So uh, till recent past, people only considered dogs, cats, maybe a few people had a few birds like budgerigars and cockatiels and things like. That. 
and uh, maybe few affluent people had horses and things like that as pets. But today, with the with the government opening up uh, the doors to declare <clears throat> uh, all the animals, there were a lot of people who had uh, pets which were kept in covers, you know, like which were not uh, really advertised because of the fear of uh, being uh, looked down upon or being and people might complain or <clears throat> basically lack of knowledge. So a few of my friends had uh, snakes, a few of them had things like turtles, you know, they had uh, scorpions, you know, tarantulas, things like that, which are generally icky, you know, a lot of people don't want to keep them. But then uh, one of the, another very big challenge in keeping animals like this is that we, do, we also don't have veterinary uh, help because a majority of them do not understand what kind of animal is it, what kind of requirement does that animal have. Okay, so uh, the the pets vary from insects. There are people. I mean, I have hissing cockroaches as pets. Uh, so you know, it can. I mean, for a lot of people, they think, why would anybody have a cockroach as a pet? But you know, a few mental people sort. Of, you know, it's just that the uh, people have a passion to keep things like that. So you could have insects, you could have amphibians, you could have reptiles, mammals, or birds. And uh, depending on, but majority of the time when people get pets like this, it's an impulsive buy. So for example, in case if uh, I have, uh, if I see a snake with a friend and I might suddenly feel, oh, I wish I had a snake because it's so cool to have one. But uh, with that comes its uh, challenges. So, <clears throat> and a majority of the Indian uh, <clears throat> people who keep pets, in fact, all over the world, I feel, but I emphasize on Indians because I think we are we are very smart in few things and we are very dumb in few things. So one of it is we just buy them as a status symbol or uh, out of impulse, and then we don't realize uh, the soup we are getting into. <coughs> so, for example, in case if uh, uh, you have uh, ball pythons, uh, there was there's a group, uh, a WhatsApp group, where people. Uh, who have reptiles uh, kind of discuss about their animals and there's there's a huge uh, debate about whether the animal should get sunlight or whether it does not need sunlight because uh, somebody says that if they if they have sunlight it's good for them somebody says that it does not need and then people say that it needs sunlight because it needs vitamin d3 and then there were some uh, biologists who said uh, the snake spends majority of the time in uh, in cavities and only comes out during night it's mostly nocturnal so <clears throat> there's no possibility of sunlight. But you know, small things like that. So a lot of people might never show it sunlight. And uh, another thing is people generally kill their animals or birds because of uh, excess love. It's not like they dislike it. They have spent money and energies and you know, time on that animal, but they haven't done their homework enough. So for example, I'll tell you one very classic example with birds. With birds, what happens is they have this large uh, aviaries um, <clears throat> with uh, just one second. I'll just mute for one. I'm sorry. So <clears throat> uh, the thing is, uh, uh, people have uh, birds, and then uh, we have skin which produces vitamin D3. Uh, you know, but then birds don't. So what happens is the bird has, you'll see the bird at times puts its head near the vent and then scratches it and starts preening its feathers. So what happens is it is, uh, there's a, it is getting the uh, uropegal gland to release uh, uh, ergosterol, which in the presence of sunlight turns into calciferol, vitamin D3. So that is how, and another thing is because vitamin D3 is uh, oil, uh, is fat soluble, it also makes the feathers very waterproof sort of thing. You know, when it's flying and it's raining, the feathers tend to repel water. So it, there's so much of evolution that, I mean, there's a certain, uh, like evolution has everything sorted out in one way or the other. So uh, people say, for example, if I buy a pair of mockers, I might feel, oh, why should I leave it out? Poor thing will feel hot and cold and no, that it might get affected with rain, so I'll keep it indoors. Now, what am I doing when I keep it indoors is I'm 
I'm depriving it of uh, having enough sunlight. So it's going to go through oh, you know, vitamin D3. It's not going to have enough vitamin D3. So vitamin D3 is, I mean, your veterinarians, you should know better than me, that, that that's the one that binds with the calcium and takes it to the so to the place that it has to go. So when there's no calcium absorption, you're going to have osteoporosis. You're going to have <coughs> eggs which are leathery or uh, even worse is uh, uh, egg binding. So uh, if you look at AV culture, a majority of the, I mean, if you look at the number of males and female deaths per year, you will see that the males are minuscule, you know, in terms of death when compared to the females, because the females have to lay eggs, they have to go through this uh, process of laying. So there's always egg binding, there's always uh, leathery uh, eggs or you know, at times out of sheer lack of calcium, uh, the female tends to die. Another thing that uh, people don't understand is they try to keep them in tiny cages because they're greedy. They want to have a lot of birds in a, in a, in a cramped area. They think, uh, you know, let me breed the bird as much as possible. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, I call it a disease where if I uh, and two other friends are sitting <clears throat> and I want to have 10 pairs of African greys and I have a 10 feet uh, balcony, 10 feet by 3 feet balcony. <coughs> Sorry. And then what happens is uh, um, I would ask the other people, what is the average cage size that I can have? Can I have 3 feet by 3 feet by 2 feet cage? Somebody would say, oh, no, 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 that other guy, Ram Babu, he has it in 1 feet by 1 feet by 2 feet cage. And then, you know, it kind of becomes a sort of uh, people kind of... Um, standardize it for their convenience but anybody with common sense would know that a bird which is so intelligent which is forget intelligence and anything that can fly should not be kept in something so small okay i also understand that a lot of people don't I mean, have they lack the space required but i would suggest try to provide it as big as, i mean i won't say provide it a hundred feet cage a lot of people's houses are not so big but no if you can provide a 10 feet cage, try and provide a 10 feet cage. Instead of having 10 pairs, have one pair. It will still breed better. So you as veterinarians, when you go and when when you have um, uh, people asking you that, you know, they'll generally send you a bird when it is sitting all morose, not head tucked near the butt, you know, and, uh, you know, it's almost at the stage of dying. That's when you'll get a call. And uh, by all probability, those birds will not survive. But... You need to educate them to them that please try and understand that you need to follow certain protocols just by reading in the on the internet or and it's not something that is rocket science. You try to provide a big cage. You try to provide sunlight. Now I had a few guests, a few friends who told me, oh, we can't provide sunlight. We don't have. Uh, you no, know, you give us some other alternative uh, protocol. We don't want to provide sunlight. Then I didn't know how to answer that. You know, I. It's like saying, can I grow fish without water? You know, possibly there is a way, I don't know. But I don't know. So, you know, I told them that it's not possible. You And they say we supplement vitamin D3 with, uh, with calcium and this and that. But because it's fat soluble, my, <clears throat> my assumption is that it sediments at the bottom of the water bowl and uh, the bird doesn't have access to drinking it. And another thing is uh, people provide a big bowl of seed. Okay, because they think, oh, my bird needs to eat a lot of food. And then they provide a very, very big bowl of seed. Now, what happens is, uh, if, if there's a little kid, you give him uh, ice cream, you give him dalcha, you give him curd rice, you give him something else, something else. What is he going to go for? He's going to go for the, for the chocolate or the cake, right? So it's the same thing with birds. When they see a big bowl of seed, they eat only the sunflower seeds. And generally, whatever is tasty is either you know, <clears throat> sinful or illegal or unhealthy. So unfortunate, that's the reality. So what happens is the bird eats seeds that it likes and then it, it leaves the rest of it. So even if you buy a very premium bird mix, which has a good ratio of uh, fats and carbohydrates and so on and so forth, fiber and stuff like that, people tend to, I mean, what happens is... Uh, they tend to eat uh, only the, the fatty seeds. 
so i would i just provide very little seed that they can finish in a day so when you serve it has a mix of all kinds of seed or you know pellets and seed or whatever you know but it has to finish everything so you need to look at protocols like this when you when you go to a facility or when you go to a private collector's place say it ha even if he has one bird or 100 birds okay so first see the cage dimensions see if there's enough sunlight see if the, the what is the feed that he is giving see if the cages are badly rusted no see if the perches are uh, are uniform so the bird needs different uh, size of uh, cage so that when it perches the 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 muscle is kind of uh, you know massaged in different places if it's just one size of perch like that then what happens is there's only certain places where the stress and then the remaining is uh, so they tend to get those boiled sort of things you no know? so simple things like this but a majority of people don't understand that or in case if a veterinarian tells them please provide some calcium or some multivitamin they will go by ostrocal and wemerol and they will think oh my bird will uh, you know i will give more than what's required so if they have to get like say 0.2 ml they would put something like 100 ml or, or even 20 ml and then you have vitamin poisoning or you have i mean they'll tend to overdo it so they don't understand dosages if you have to provide them uh, if you tell them provide doxycycline they do not understand the dosage that is required so that is extremely important that uh, and there will be a lot of self medication this is another very big disease in indian av culture or indian pet industry in general what happens is uh, presuming that uh, like the beautiful uh, introduction that i got before starting my seminar uh, <clears throat> now all of you presume that i am a very uh, that i have a lot of uh, knowledge on bird keeping and so on and so forth now presuming one of you asked me a question on say pheasants i don't know anything about pheasants but presuming that you have asked me a, bird, a question on pheasants and if i say i don't know then i am an idiot right or you know at least in my head there's a ego ego problem i would think what the hell how can i how can they think that i don't uh, know and you know i'll try to cook up some story right so this storytelling is the biggest problem so if somebody says oh my bird has a little um, you know watery eye they will say use ciplox d okay they do not know what ciplox what d stands for in ciplox okay but they will say use ciplox d so this is another that self medication you know and uh, self medication is okay but when you do it to a bird where you don't know the the <clears throat> uh, what do you call the the dosage or the requirement and things like that it's going to end up as a disaster so this is another very big challenge that you will face if you talk to people like Ra reena or rani or charmin or any other veterinarian you will see that this is the reality a lot of people use their own dosage you, and then they will randomly use things like tetracycline doxycycline fluconazole whatever they like you know they don't even know without even the knowledge of whether um, whether it's a fungal infection a bacterial infection protozoal infection or whether it's parasitic or whether it's just a mechanical rupture as in at times the bird would have just hit something like a branch or something like that and it there could be a little tear you know <coughs> and then they will start doing their own medication so there was um, one such example which reena was giving in one of her seminars was there was a guy who had a bird with a broken leg so he could see that the bone was sticking out and he said i'll come and uh, get show you the bird and can you fix it and she said yes please come and then when she, when he took the bird there there was a small piece of uh, bone missing so she said there's a bo there's a piece missing and he's like yeah i cut it and threw it away so you know yeah so those are the kind of things that you will face so please uh, when you are i mean because i'm addressing veterinarians i would request you it's a humble request that when you the this this field has a lot of future there are not many great veterinarians in the country there are a few and i'm sure we are uh, like i know one mr shushil sood who who is key in uh, uh, artificial insemination for kakapuas in new zealand which are almost extinct 
and now they're bouncing back and trogons and things like that. And there are, of course, great doctors like Rani Rina and so on and so forth, so many of them. Uh, but there is a huge scope because the number of pets we have to the number of uh, passionate veterinarians we have is, I think there's a big gap, a big lacuna. So uh, the, the simple things that you need to understand, because there are now the, the possibility of having uh, a very varied kind of pet uh, pets is uh, going to be a reality very soon. Uh, so, presuming you have sugar gliders, you need to understand that the marsupials and the nocturnal, and uh, a lot of people just feed them serlac. So, you need to understand and tell them that it's not just serlac, but you need to give them. You know, it's <clears throat> you know, you need to look at what are they going to eat in the wild. So they're going to eat little eggs and uh, chicks and insects and things like that. So there's a little bit of animal protein that's required. So stuff like that. You know, as veterinarians, it's extremely important to kind of uh, understand what the animal needs. In, For example, in the case of iguanas, they need four times more calcium. Uh, anything less than the female will go into osteoporosis and the breeding success is going to stop. I mean, all the females are going to die. <coughs> so you need to understand uh, that when somebody has uh, uh, iguana, try to tell him to feed them a lot of drumstick or, you know, because it has a lot of calcium or uh, things like uh, subabul or no, no stuff like that, whichever, whatever is rich in calcium. Basically, um, it is my belief that I, I understand that there are companies which make great products, uh, supplements and things like that. But uh, it is my opinion that um, it is better that uh, you try to give them natural sources. So, for example, in our aviary, uh, we give neem as a as a natural uh, dewormer. You know, we <coughs> we provide dandelion for uh, for liver issues. Just before breeding, we give a lot of dandelion. So, what happens is uh, the, there's no liver issues, uh, there's no liver problems. We give them <coughs> uh, drumsticks and things like that, uh, drumstick leaves which is uh, considered a superfood. It has a lot of vitamins and minerals and calcium and things like that. Then we also provide them a lot of flowers like hibiscus, rose, marigolds and things like that uh, <clears throat> for the pool. Now, these are small things that make, a, that, that make a huge difference. Okay. So this is one aspect of, uh, you know, the, so we try, to, we try to do things as natural as possible. Uh, we understand that, uh, I mean, I've been told that one of the symptoms of a bad liver is overgrowing beak. So if you have a beak and then it starts overgrowing more than what's required, that's generally the uh, uh, sign that there's a liver problem. So we immediately give it uh, dandelions. Dandelions are weeds in India. We find them everywhere. <coughs> so stuff like that. You can, uh, and then once in a while, a little bit of ginger uh, and a little bit of garlic, you know, make uh, they kind of help. And uh, as a detox, we throw a piece of charcoal into the aviary, you know, into the uh, enclosure because it acts as a strong uh, chelating agent. We also provide uh, aloe vera juice and things like that in the water. Um, <clears throat> and another thing is uh, when it comes to, oh, supplementing uh, anything that's uh, synthetic. We try to provide, uh, uh, so if there's anything synthetic, we don't, a lot of a lot of people tend to mix it in water, but I avoid mixing it in water uh, purely because if, uh, say for example, I have 200 ml of water and I mix say 2 ml of, uh, say, Wim Roll or something like that, and then, and then the next day or after, even after a couple of hours, if I smell it, it's going to stink like really bad. That's because it's uh, there's a bacterial bloom in the water. Okay, they say so. If you see the graph, though, bacteria growth is really high. So I would not want to feed my birds so much of bacteria. I mean, more bacteria than the multivitamin that I'm giving. So I would rather. Uh, and another thing is, when we had hundred pairs of conures, uh, <clears throat> we would give ten liters of water. So when we gave ten, sorry, twenty liters of water. 
So in 20 liters of water, <coughs> we would provide, uh, we would mix something like 40 ml of, uh, say, uh, of uh, Vimral. Okay. Then one day when it was not very hot, not very cold, where the birds didn't take bath and things like that, we collected the water back uh, in a couple of hours just to see how much of water is consumed. We got approximately 19 and a half liters back. So, which means that 100 pairs of birds drank un, uh, 500 ml of water. 500 ml of water is about 2.5. I mean, I'm talking 100 pairs of birds. So, we're looking at 200 birds. So about 2.5 ml per liter uh, per bird is what was consumed. So, um, and then if I look at it in terms of uh, how much of uh, supplement had been consumed, it's 1 ml. Because 2 ml per liter, half a liter was consumed. So it's only 1 ml which was consumed by so many birds. And the rest all I was throwing away. Financially, it doesn't make any difference. But uh, resources, I feel, should not be wasted. Okay. So <clears throat> that way, uh, we kind of, uh, you know, we don't like. And so the more important thing is we, we are feeding that water which is full of bacteria in a short period of time. So instead, what we do is, if 100 birds need 1 ml of, uh, of Vimerol or whatever, actually, we don't use Vimerol and Ostrocal. That was when we started. But now we use mostly product from Varsalaha or Pet Care International and things like that. <coughs> so what we do is, uh, we take, instead of 1 ml, we take 2 or 3 ml, mix it in water, a little bit of water, just to make it, uh, if it's very thick, and then spray it on the vegetables. Uh, and then give it to our birds. Now our birds are hungry in the morning. They quickly devour all the vegetables that are provided. So it's a much more effective way of supplementing uh, anything and another supplement. And uh, also it's much more uh, effective as in you're not wasting resources. So this is another uh, thing that I would like to talk about. Now, <clears throat> after that, uh, so you need to understand that the, this this husbandry protocols have to be established by the veterinarian because uh, I'll just turn on the light. Just give me one second. Hey, perfect. So I could see myself going dark and then, yeah. So the thing is, these husbandry protocols are to be established by the veterinarian because a majority of the people, uh, as I told you, are only emotional. They don't understand the, the dynamics of, of housing an animal and uh, taking care of it over a period of time. Okay. It's generally impulsive. And then uh, most probably after a few days, they'd like to get rid of it. Or they would like to, <clears throat> I mean, I know people who, who say, okay, fine, we will start a aviary. We, I like birds, but you no, know, if there's money in it, why not sort of thing? I'd like to do it commercially. <clears throat> they're a little shy. They don't want to say that, you know, that they're doing it for money. I don't think that there's any harm in thinking so. But then you need to understand that, uh, mm, that they lack the knowledge or the drive to, 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 to take to invest in the in the infrastructure of making one and to form protocols. So there is definitely a lot of platforms on which protocols can be available. Uh, you will uh, you will notice that a lot of people will not hesitate spending one lakh rupees on uh, on a pair of birds or a, or a single bird, but they will crib and cry to spend five hundred rupees more on a cage, and they will they will feel like you've you've cut off their kidney in case if you tell them to show it to a vet. Okay. I know so many people who have uh, birds like macaws, like cockatoos and grays, which are really expensive and uh, which are really rare. Uh, they're not like you find them everywhere. <clears throat> and then when the bird is uh, sick and it is sitting at the bottom of the cage, when it's all tucked in, where it is almost at the verge of dying, then they will take a photo and then post it uh, on WhatsApp to me or to somebody else or on a group saying, what can be done? Now, if I could see a photograph of a human being and tell what's wrong with him or her, I'd be a bloody billionaire, <laughs> right or wrong. So these people expect <clears throat> veterinarians also to understand 
just by sending a photograph. They will, and then if you ask them, oh, how is the fecal matter, whether, <coughs> you know, what's the diet that they've given, on and so forth, they will try to give you as vague an answer as possible. So you need to understand that you're working with people who are, who don't know anything about uh, the bird, who don't want to come to a veterinarian, and this perspective will slowly change. Um, but by and large, they are very, very apprehensive about coming to uh, a veterinarian. So <clears throat> these are a uh, few, few challenges that you will face. The third most important thing is the nutrition. Uh, see, a lot of people, um, so I'll talk from a breeder's point of view. They, we were very successful in breeding our birds. We had a facility which uh, which housed about 100 and, uh, 160 enclosures. We would have anywhere between 120 to 140 pairs of birds in that. And uh, we would breed, I mean, but then the breeding stock would only be about 60 to 70 pairs. The rest were all young from the previous uh, clutch. From the 600, uh, uh, from, from that 60 pairs, we produced about 800 to 850 pairs of 8, 850 birds per, per annum. So it was phenomenal the number of uh, birds we would, uh, uh, we would get into this world. Uh, we would do a lot of incubation. We would do a lot of hand rearing. Uh, our protocols on hand rearing and uh, incubation are phenomenal. Uh, that's a whole different topic. I will not talk about that because that will take away at least two hours of, you know, your time. When. So, <clears throat> you know, uh, when we did this and then people thought we had the secret medicine, okay, like a little Viagra that we would give to our birds and then, you know, they start laying eggs in no time. Uh, the thing is, it is my belief that an animal will breed either when it's stressed or when it has an effluence, you know, when it has an excess, okay. So, things like plants uh, tend to flower and fruit during winter because the soil is freezing and then they think that I'm going to die. So I quickly have to you know, reproduce and uh, make something dormant, you know. So the cell chooses dormancy under, under stress conditions, like reproduce, but provide a dormant uh, offspring, you know, so that when favorable conditions come, they can, you know, kind of open up and, uh, you know, again, become a plant or whatever, insect or whatever. But then uh, majority of the animals breed when they have excess food, when they have rich food. So uh, I ask a lot of, so when they ask me, sir, what is the secret for your breeding? I tell them that we, for birds, it's protein is the magic food. So we call some, we have something called an enrichment based diet and a breeding diet. Okay. And then when I'm telling this to people over phone, they say, sir, I don't want the nutri en enrichment diet. Just tell me the breeding diet. Okay, only breeding diet, please. So I tell them that the two sides are the same coin. You can't avoid one and have the other one. Okay. So enrichment-based diet. So this is extremely important, you know. Uh, this is uh, something that is quite often uh, um, neglected in, in most cases. Enrichment. Uh, so if you look at zoos, you have a lot of zoonotic diseases in animals. Uh, where they are, <clears throat> they have that repetitive uh, uh, pattern of walking or acting and things like that. So the same thing can happen to birds because a bird that's supposed to fly so many kilometers or do so many things, especially parrots and things like that or monkeys, uh, you know, are kept in confined spaces and you need to keep them uh, happy, right? So enrichment is extremely important. Uh, in enrichment, uh, we, for, I'll talk about parrots, okay, because, uh, I mean, you have a book called, uh, by Central Zoo Authority, which has something about enrichment, which is very well done, very well written. Uh, but then, basically, do keep keep them active in, in, in as many ways as possible. So, for example, for us, uh, <clears throat> when, when we provide carrots, we don't cut them into tiny pieces and then put them in a bowl and give we throw a carrot on top of a cage. So the bird will start hanging at the bottom and then start trying to tear it up. Okay. Psychologically, it makes them happier. If I, once in a while, I just throw a, a branch inside of say, of neem or 
of mango, guava, whatever I can find. So they sit and keep chewing it up. That is their natural instinct. You know, by doing that, they feel happy. Uh, what is the role of a of a parrot in nature? Is uh, see, every animal has a role in nature. Evolution has made sure that everybody has has something to do. The parrot's role in nature is when a plant is growing, you know, vertically. Only the apical bud is growing. So this bird sits and then tears away the apical bud. Then the axillary bud start growing out. The plant becomes into a bush. Thereby, more foliage is growing. More foliage translates to more sunlight being absorbed. More sunlight being absorbed means more more flowering and more fruiting. Thereby, sustaining the forest. Okay. So the bird's instinct is to tear things apart. Now, if you neatly cut them and give them, there is no there's no joy in its life. Okay. So try to do something that's that's joyous in its life. I know people who put metal perches or put plastic perches or something which the bird can't break. The bird wants to chew on something and break things down. So we we put branches which which we have to replace every week. You know, it is a lot of work for us, but I enjoy doing it because that's the basic requirement that the bird has. So that is enrichment, where we provide them with very little seed, okay, and a lot of branches, flowers, fruits, things like you know, less fruit, mostly vegetables and flowers and you know. <clears throat> branches and things like that, where they can keep tearing. You know, the idea is not to gain energy; it is to spend energy. Okay, uh, you need to understand that arboreal birds, flying birds, uh, find that their testes and their uh, ovaries are excess baggage while flying. So they tend to shrink, and during breeding time, they tend to engorge. So if you can do surgical sexing of the bird, you will see also the breeding. Uh, um, phase of the bird whether it's about to breed or whether it isn't going to breed okay so uh, an uh, enrichment diet is basically where you keep the bird active and uh, you kind of uh, give very little seed and mostly uh, you know branches and things like where they is working on then we quickly move it into a, into a, i mean after about two or three months when we want the bird to breed we we like in in the enrichment based diet there's no protein source it's only carbohydrate and and fat, uh, sorry, and fat and uh, uh, fiber. Okay. Then once it comes to the the breeding, uh, when we want the birds to breed, we provide sprout in the morning. Okay. So where the carbohydrate is converted into protein. There also what we do, some we just soak, some seeds we just soak, some we have only a shoot, some we have the shoot and the root. So what happens is the amino acid ra ratios differ. Uh, I mean. Kind of vary when we are providing them uh, this uh, um, sprouts. So then, what happens is uh, when we provide the sprout, <clears throat> they uh, this this suddenly a, we call it a, a protein boost. Okay, so once uh, sorry, a protein spike is what we call it. So we spike the protein suddenly, and then the bird feels, oh, I'm getting rich food, and then it goes to breeding. So when I ask people, what is your what is that that you feed? No, before I tell them about the enrichment based diet and the breeding diet, <clears throat> they will tell me that you know, their diet is constant throughout the year. Morning, I provide some sprout, afternoon, I provide some vegetables, night, I provide some seeds. Now, you tell me if I gave you every day a little biryani, I mean, I'm from Hyderabad, so I have to say biryani, you know, and I gave you some sambar. And I gave you some uh, vegetables in the night. Would you be happy if that was the diet all through? Okay. So you need to understand that the bird needs a change in diet uh, for it to uh, start breeding. Okay. So that is about the nutrition. And again, as I told you, a lot of people, when you say you provide them with seed or you provide them with vegetables or fruit, they put large quantities of food and uh, seed. And then they think, oh, I have money, so or it's not about the money, but it is just that that love for the for the animal. They think, oh, fine, okay, I can provide, so why not provide? But they should understand that that's actually undoing what they are what they are trying to reach or what they are trying to aim at. So, <coughs> so this is uh, what I wanted to talk about. Uh, so, do, do do any one of you have questions?
Um, if there are no questions, then I can keep continuing. Yeah, I think we can continue and then we'll take if there are any questions like at the end of the session. Okay. And so, uh, if you guys don't have questions, either you are understanding everything perfectly or you're not understanding a word of what I'm saying. <laughs> so, no, no, either way. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, uh, it's okay. It, it's all right. I mean, I'll uh, keep uh, talking about uh, this thing. And then, uh, so um, then this is about birds. When it comes to reptiles, uh, I I have a, I had a friend who who wanted to have uh, uh, milk snakes and uh, corn snakes and ball pythons and things like that. And then, and then he was like. Uh, Dude, my snakes keep dying. I bought like about 50 of them and I have some two or three left and I don't know what to do with them. So I asked him, how are they dying? You know? And then he told me, dude, I provide the, the sorry, I provide them with a, some 500 SFT of space and uh, this and that and all that. And then I was like, no, show me a video. And then uh, he sent me a video of his, his place. So it was basically like a room of torture, okay, where there's just a lot of snakes running around and it's just one big room, <coughs> you know, and uh, the flooring was marble. So obviously in the night when it was getting really cold during the winters, <coughs> the snakes could not uh, metabolize or, you know, they get they basically freezing and dying. So obviously when they're frozen, they don't want to eat and, you know, they were regurgitating what they were eating and stuff like that. No, so then I told him that you know you can put all of them in one cupboard, basically make a cupboard, and then provide a hide, a little water, a little water bowl, a little hide, and a perch. That's all in a one and a half feet by one feet by one feet box that can keep a five foot snake inside happily for the rest of its life. You just remove it, give it enough sunlight. And then put it back because I'm a believer of sunlight. Whether the snake wants it or not, I feel that the that the snake should have enough sunlight to thrive on. Okay, so provide it with a little bit of sunlight, let the metabolism go up, and then feed it a rat or a mouse or whatever you know, whatever you feed it, or dead or alive or whatever. You now that's debatable. And then put it back into its enclosure. Let it have its hide where it can go inside and it can hide. Okay, and then a little always fresh water for it to drink and then a perch for it to shed its skin. That's it. Okay, and since then his snakes have been doing really well. So he now has all of them in cupboards. So <clears throat> God bless somebody who thinks there's a lot of money in it and tries to open it up. <laughs> so, but at the same time, you have another snake called uh, uh, the green tree python. Okay, it's another very beautiful snake and uh, unfortunately very few survived when uh, people tried to keep them. Uh, the reason that they did not survive is that they need high humidity. Uh, a lot of people who kept them could, didn't know how to keep them. So to, if you are housing a green tree python, you need to have a brooder okay, with a lot of humidity inside, about uh, 60 to 70% humidity and then keep the snake inside the brooder. They do very, very well in that, you know. So <clears throat> you need to understand the requirement of each animal. Uh, funny thing like cockroaches, suppose they drown in water. So you don't provide them water in a bowl. You wet a tissue and keep it there so that they can eat from the tissue. They can drink from the tissue. And But otherwise, feeding them is extremely easy. You can just put some dog uh, pellets or bread or vegetables, whatever you like, you know, I mean, if you provide something like vegetables, you don't even need to provide water. Uh, they can actually sustain on that. And uh, again, they're very prolific breeders. There's also a huge market for them, both, sorry, both as pets and as, um, as diet for other uh, reptiles and things like that. And uh, when it came to reptiles, another uh, interesting thing is uh, we, in our, uh, when I try to make a terrarium or, you know, a place for them to stay, I try to provide a, a heat source in one place and then a colder place somewhere far off. 
So if you have a tree or something like that, I try to put a bulb over it. Uh, I'll, if anybody is interested, they can send me a message on my uh, WhatsApp number. It is 988-522-974. Okay, I repeat 988-522-974. Okay, Nanda Keshar. So then I'll send you a video of the enclosure for our uh, iguanas. So there, for example, the, the animal has the freedom to either go heat itself, exit underneath the warm light or to go away from it. So we let the animal choose. But at times, if you have things like snakes, they tend to burn themselves. They tend to stick to the bulb. So you need to provide a little distance from that. Uh, that is one thing. And then another very important thing that uh, that I feel that all doctors should uh, kind of coax their uh, clientele to have when they have birds is a hospital cage. A hospital cage is a really simple cage. It's a small transport cage where you can keep the, animal, the bird inside. Cover it on all sides except the front. Even the front top half you cover. Only the bottom half is open. You cover everything with... Uh, say a gunny bag or <clears throat> or a shade net or something like that. Preferably something that doesn't let heat dissipate. Okay, <clears throat> I wouldn't mind if it is actually a plastic uh, cover or a, or a um, cloth uh, cover for it. A thick cloth cover. Provide a heat source at the bottom. It could be a heating pad. It could it could also be a, a hundred watt bulb. But then you can cover it with aluminium foil so that the, only the heat is dissipated and the light doesn't come in. So you provide it with a little bit of seed and water inside and where the heat is coming. So if this is the aquarium, uh, the, the cage bottom, and then you have a bulb where the heat is dissipating, right above that you'll have the perch. So the bird has the freedom to move away from the heat or onto the heat. Okay. And, uh, you know, you basically keep it in a stress-free environment where it doesn't see people, where it feels secluded, where it has water and feed and where it has heat source. By and large, what I've noticed is uh, the birds tend to survive much better uh, in a facility like that. Uh, you know, uh, the only thing you need to do is give it a little bit of pre prebiotic, like apple cider vinegar or something like that, to keep the gut pH right, and then give it a little bit of probiotic. The best probiotic I've noticed in birds is if you have a healthy bird, the fecal matter of that bird is the best probiotic. I know it sounds yucky. But if you could take a little bit of the fecal matter of a healthy bird, mix it in hand feeding formula and feed it to a sick bird, I've seen that it kind of recovers very, very fast. In case if you find that really um, unethical or if you think that it's not right, then you can provide it with, uh, um, you know, with uh, curd whey or sporolac or I don't know, the few more uh, commercially available uh, pre probiotics in the, in the market. Uh, Vashlaha and Vita, Vita Pool, I think, uh, have them, uh, have commercial uh, uh, prebiotics and probi have probiotics in, uh, in the market. So you can definitely use that. Uh, and then, so that, the, so hospital cage is one thing that you will, that I would suggest every breeder, every pet, pet owner should have. And another thing is a little aquarium like thing. Uh, where you can nebulize the bird. You know, it's a simple thing, but a lot of people don't invest in that. It could just be a plastic uh, transport cage, which is covered and with a little uh, place where you can fix a nebulizer and then, you know, nebulize the bird in case if it has any nasal problems and things like that. Uh, the birds tend to re generally recover very, very fast when this is done. So, uh, Is there anything else that I, that you want me to talk about? Because it's exactly one hour since we started, so. So we have one or two questions coming up. So we'll cover them up right now. Yes, please. Sam? Yeah, so, so there's one question. Uh, what's your opinion about uh, trafficking of exotic animals? Uh, that is uh, That has always been a very dark topic and uh, you know that's something that like for example i know people who have chimpanzees and gorillas as pets and things like that uh, 
it's a known fact that the, that the parent would not let go of the of the young so in most cases uh, the parents are shot and then uh, the the baby is taken from the parent or you know if it comes to things like birds uh, a lot of them uh, are poached from the forest and uh, you know a lot of them die in the process also you know i would uh, my uh, if i am right anywhere between 40 to 60% of them die before reaching uh, the client you know the end client so uh it is a very dark thing it is not the best thing to do but that would not happen in case if uh, the laws are easy to import birds uh if uh, if i could buy a bird from say europe from a breeder in europe or a breeder in thailand or in taiwan or wherever it would be so much more easier for me i mean things like this would would stop but at the same time i also uh, i mean so i do, i don't endorse doing that none of my birds are wild caught they are all captive bred uh, including the birds that that we have in various zoos uh, i i am now constructing a large walk in aviary for indore zoo madhya pradesh so even there every bird that's coming has been sourced uh, which have been captive bred so i don't i do not endorse it in any way uh, when i say that i'm a i'm an animal lover I, it's not justified when i do something like that you know but at the same time i will contradict myself by telling that uh, the number of animals or birds removed for pet trade is a minuscule when compared to the number of animals that die because of deforestation so when i had uh, birds initially when i was not nanda sir when i was just nandu okay <laughs> so then we had uh, a few uh, young kids from from an ngo who came and then they said oh you're keeping birds in cages and this and that so i would open each nest box and then show them the number of chicks and eggs in each you know in, in all the nest boxes and i would tell them that if you look at the number of birds or you look at any species on the planet except human beings the number is declining the only num- the only po- positive population is human beings where we are constantly growing in number you know despite wars despite diseases despite everything we are still prolifically breeding and uh, you know there's a joke uh, that i have that indians are the most hypocritic people the sex is a taboo but we are the largest population on the planet so <laughs> you know uh, either way not uh, no not getting into jokes but the thing is uh, it's always deforestation which is a bigger problem and uh, so i would tell them don't come behind people i mean don't try to uh, kind of corner me and try to make me feel guilty that i have some birds in enclosures because if that bird doesn't breed there's always demand and the supply is going to come from the indian forest so it's going to be those green ring necks you know or alexandrian parrots or plum head parrots which are going to be caught from the wild and they're going to be you know given there so i am kind of contributing to cutting down i mean i'm trying to contribute towards the conservation of forests but if i were to change uh, any of this i would plant more trees uh, and you know try to stop the rampant deforestation so i don't know if i answered the question or whether it's too diplomatic but this is on my honest opinion thank you sir i think you answered that uh, we have another question um except for calcium and vitamin deficiency yeah i have another question tell me please apart from the deficiencies that we covered right now like calcium and vitamin d deficiency what are the other common problems we see in exotic birds um majority of the times one another thing that you would see is feather plucking so a lot of people uh, tend to come especially if they're tame birds they tend to uh, have a lot of uh, feather plucking it is basically a, i mean this is one thing when you told me you no know, the first thing that comes to my head is feather plucking um you can see i am feather plug too but that's because of my wife <laughs> but then no 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 she's genuinely and nice, i she's right next to me so i can't yeah <laughs> so no but the thing is uh it's basically two reasons that uh, feather plucking is noticed if it is not the head and the chest part and things like that self mutilation it's either uh, 
and if it's a tame bird it's basically you need to understand that the birds are flock are, live in large flocks so they have a lot of individuals with with whom they can interact with but then a pet bird is a single bird in a small cage where it has a few toys which is which it would have already been bored of in a short period of time and it would want to you know play i mean it looks at its its owner as as a partner you know as as its flock and if he is busy um, on his computer or watching tv or something like that and he doesn't want to spend enough time with them then it's like those crazy girlfriends who say i'll kill myself if you don't give me enough time you know where they feather plucking that's their that's their way of telling the owner that please i need your attention you know so that is one reason the second thing is it's a bad habit it's like smoking you know smoking is a bad habit everybody knows every box of cigarettes have that dirty you know cancerous lung photo on it but people still smoke because it's a habit so for them uh, if they don't have enough enrichment in the enclosure they tend to keep feather pulling out the feather and then they'll keep nibbling on the little uh, on the end of the feather on the end of the shaft there's little blood uh you know it's slightly soft and then they tend to nibble on that and throw it down so that's another very uh, so these are basically two reasons that you will see feather plucking the first thing you can do is give it enough enrichment and enough, and the owner should give provide it with enough uh uh and mm, enough uh, time and energy you know and is spending a lot of time with the bird uh because there are a few birds which are uh which are bonded only with one uh, of the family member like i had a african grey which loved me only uh, if it saw anybody else it would try to go and kill them okay it will at least that's what was going in its head it will try to go bite but in its head it just wants to kill you <laughs> know so it's very bonded to me so i have to provide that much of time for it every day otherwise it feels neglected so you the owner has to spend a lot of time so you have behavior correction uh, methods for for pet birds you can do that the uh, <clears throat> second thing is give it enough enrichment the third thing is you you have you get a few sprays like uh, i think uh, both uh, pet care international and uh, varsala uh, have the product where you can spray it on the chest and it's so bitter that they will not generally not want to touch it no touch the taste is so bad that they will not want to feather pluck so it's like nicorette for them you know so yeah that's one that uh, that you will face then uh, another thing is egg uh, they you but that's not really i mean breaking of eggs a few uh, birds tend to break the eggs but i don't think that is really important for a veterinary from veterinary point of view but i'll still i mean do you want me to talk about that okay so uh when uh, majority of the time the birds tend to break their eggs uh, because uh, i am presuming none of you are married right okay so i will not crack dirty jokes but uh, you know uh, what happens is when the male and the female are uh, So a few birds like conures tend to spend a lot of time inside the nest box during the night they said they tend to sit together inside the nest box and uh, once the eggs are laid the female doesn't want the male to sit right next to it you know it won't spend more time on the eggs and things like that so it there's a lot of scuffling around between the male and female that's one of the reasons that the eggs break so if you could just provide a small ledge uh, somewhere in between the nest box the male would sit there and then keep watching its female you know down and it can also look outside what's happening outside so that's one way to stop it the second reason that the eggs break is because there's too much sunlight if you see uh, ring necks and things like that in nature when coconut trees and things like that they have very tiny hole and then through that a bird that's that big will squeeze in okay and uh, once it goes inside it's generally dark the the uh, the tree inside would generally be dark brown because of rainy season and things like that you know muck falling on it dirt and all that it would have become dark almost black to tan brown okay 
so there's so it's absorbing all the sunlight but our guys when we breed uh, uh, birds the, for us main door should be really huge right so they provide a, a hole which is that big for a bird that can fit in you know if it, the bird is this much it will provide in a, a hole this big so first thing is it feels threatened that a predator can get into the nest box and the second thing is there's so much light inside that the bird doesn't feel comfortable so that's another reason that they tend to break the eggs the third thing is again a bad habit where they tend to break the eggs so what you can do is you can take uh, a egg which is already hatched okay uh, put a little bit of ammonia into it okay uh, ammonia smells terrible we can put a few drops of ammonia put the egg back and seal it with nail polish uh, clear nail polish okay or you could put a micropore tape around it and then seal it with uh, uh, clear nail polish and then put it into the eggs the bird when it breaks this egg the smell is going to be so bad it's not going to break another egg yeah uh, another tip i'm going to give you is uh, in nutrition if somebody asks you what is the best nutrition uh, I've, i in my head the two good nutrition uh, there just two two things which are really good like if the bird is sick and you need to provide it with something to live on okay the first is you get hand, commercial hand feeding for nurse like versla i19 uh, you have supreme and then you have uh, hagens and there's so many companies which are available uh, hand feeding for nurse so it's warm and it's very uh, comforting for the bird to have so you could just mix that and then provide it in a bowl for the bird to lap it up uh, that's one really good uh, food for a sick bird but if it is able to eat by itself and then if it is still trying to look around eggs are the best thing to to feed boiled eggs with, with crushed shell so egg food basically so basically it's like cannibalism the bird whatever the bird wants is already in a in a compact form okay so that's another thing that i would strongly suggest Okay, thank you, sir. So yeah. we have one more question. Uh, mm -hmm. It's basically related to climate change. So, what are the common problems we are facing right now due to climate change, or any common managemental factors that we have to look upon? Okay. So yes, weather is going to change dramatically, uh, and uh, we already have uh, problems with. Uh, with the weather fluctuation you no know, dramatic fluctuation of the weather so our facility in the breeding center was we provided a little microclimate for our birds so we had our uh, enclosures one beside the other but we had a master cage which had basically four walls on four sides and a mesh on top so the roof was a mesh and on top of that there's a shade net so we are cutting down on 50% of the sunlight coming in because hyderabad is a tropical and very very hot place so we are cutting down on 50% of the light coming in and also at times we have hail storm that comes so we didn't want our birds to get hit on the head so that's one of the reasons that uh, we had the shade net uh, and uh, we also had a lot of plants and we still if you see our aviary now it looks like a little rain forest so uh there's enough humidity and uh, you know uh, enough foliage for them to or to actually feel comfortable and to provide a small microclimate okay uh so our humidity general hyderabad humidity is about 30 to 40% uh in the aviary it is anywhere between 50 to 80% you know so we have higher humidity there we have less sunlight the birds are more comfortable but they still have access to sunlight and rain okay so but then when it comes to <clears throat> winters uh, we don't have a problem uh, because the we feel that the birds feel cold but what happens is they open their they fluff their feathers and then they close them back so what happens is because the warm blooded animals this they have two kinds of feathers one is the contour feathers one is the down feathers the down feathers are like the fluffy thing inside your blanket okay so that's what keeps them warm but once they close the contour feathers the external air is not getting inside so there's a warm blanket of air inside where the bird can feel comfortable i have friends in 
places like Moscow and things like that are in Prague, where it goes to about minus 15 uh, degrees in winter, where the, everything is ice, and they have birds like macaws, cockatoos, splendids, some finches also flying around in their aviaries, where the water is frozen. So they're actually playing with ice. So uh, winter is not a problem. Summer, you can just turn on the sprinkler once in five to 10 minutes you know, uh, per hour to cool the place down. Or you could just tie a, a gunny bag, which is washed in uh, vircon or corsolin, a strong disinfectant, uh, you know, and then wet it and just tie it around your aviary. Uh, the breeze from that will really get the temperature down. Uh, so these are two things. The biggest problem is actually rainy season where the fungal and bacterial load is very high. So when you provide them with sprout, so we would rather avoid uh, breeding our birds during rainy season because when we provide sprout, we don't let the sprout stay there for more than an hour because uh, we have, with, with, so sprouts are a blessing and a bane, you know? So what happens is it's very rich in protein so we can get our birds to breed. But at the same time, it also uh, tends to catch a lot of, because hot and humid, you have a lot of bacteria and fungal growth also happening parallelly. So before we serve our uh, sprouts, we actually wash it in 5% of apple cider vinegar. That's 5 grams, 5 ml per uh, 1000 liter, 1000 ml of water. Per liter of water, we wash it thoroughly uh, so that we can uh, you know, wash away the fungal growth inside. So even then we keep like that much of sprout in one bowl, there could still be a little microclimate inside, which is warm and humid. So we would not want that. So generally rainy season, we avoid breeding our birds for that simple reason. Uh, the, and also a few birds tend to, so uh, do we have time? Can I speak for another five, 10 minutes? Yes, sir. Okay, perfect. So what happens is the birds uh, are, um, they actually understand uh, how like the weather change and things like that and they adapt according to that. So for example, if uh, there's a pair of sun conures in Kerala, okay, Kerala is humid, no? So uh, when an egg is laid, it has to lose anywhere between 15 to 19% of its body weight by the time it hatches. So if it's a period of 21 days or 22 days, in the 22 days, it's supposed to lose 15 to 19% of its body weight. So the fe the female uh, sun conure there will lay an egg which has very thin shell and lot of pores, okay? Because it has to dissipate that amount of humidity from inside. But you get that uh, you you would look at uh, a pair of sun conures in Hyderabad or in Rajasthan, you know where it is very hot and uh, dry. They will lay a thick layer of shell with very few pores because if there are too many pores. It will lose more than 90% of the 19% of the hue of the body weight and it will dry out. Okay. So if I get a pair from Kerala to Rajasthan, the bird will keep laying eggs and the eggs will keep, uh, they'll be dead in, dead in shell. That's the, the embryo would be drying out inside the shell for the first two or three cycles. After that, the female understands and then regulates the amount of calcium that's to be put. No, around the egg. So the birds know how to modulate the production of their eggs or the quality of their eggs. So <clears throat> this is very important that the birds know. So at times when also in case if, if they feel that the humidity is too less inside the box, they'll actually go take bath in the water, get into the nest box and then wet the eggs. Okay. So this also we try to, that this is another reason that we try to avoid breeding during rainy season is there can be a lot of fungal mold inside the nest box because there's no cross ventilation inside the nest box because we have wood chips inside. And if there's too much water, it can start growing mold inside. So it can be risky. So that's my answer to this. Okay. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Uh, we have one more question. Uh, what should we do if we ever come across a migratory bird injured or trapped? Since handling them ourselves may have a zoonotic risk involved. Um, uh, since handling them by ourselves, no. um, so the 
I am not really the right person to talk about this because uh, I have not really dealt with uh, migratory birds and things like that, or at least the the hospital aspect of it. I think uh, Rina or Rani would be a better person to talk about it. But uh, in my opinion, I don't know. I feel that if there's a bird that's injured, it's supposed to, and the probability of it surviving is very, very low. So if you can do something and you know risk whatever, even if it's zoonotic disease, I mean, if you take care of yourself and you know if you could just hold it on for another season where where the flock comes back again next year, maybe it can rejoin and go away. But I am not the right person to talk about it. I mean, I'd be bluffing if I gave you an answer. Any more questions? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Well, I think you can continue. There are no more questions. There's no more questions? Uh, yeah, there is one in the comment. So, how often you met uh, metal toxicity in birds as birds tend to use their beaks as a hand to move around the cage? Yes, that is a very valid question. Uh, a lot of birds tend to have heavy metal poisoning, uh, especially because they either have rusted cages or galvanized iron cages. Now, galvanized iron cages, they have this white powdery stuff that's stuck to the mesh that's, that also is ingested by these birds. <coughs> and because they, as I told you, that they are like little monkeys which have to keep chewing on something or the other, they tend to keep uh, biting uh, the enclosures. Oh, sorry, they they tend to keep biting the enclosure uh, uh, wires very every now and then. So we have two forms of uh, two two ways of kind of uh, combating the problem. The first thing is charcoal. You just put a big chunk of charcoal inside the aviary. The bird will start chewing on it, and ingesting that charcoal generally tends to detoxify the body. The first thing. The second thing is aloe vera juice. Aloe vera also is a strong chelating agent. So it tends to, but the problem with uh, aloe vera is uh, when you provide aloe vera juice to your birds, they tend to have free motions. It's not, a lot of people get scared that, oh, I, my bird is having loose motions and maybe uh, the gut uh, uh, flora is uh, damaged and this and that, but that's not true. Uh, it's like, um, you know, those fruits that you get, the toddy, plant those white fruits that you eat. When you eat that, you have, uh, it acts as a laxative, right? So it's the same thing. Aloe vera juice also acts as a laxative. So when the birds eat, it tends to uh, come out, uh, I mean, it, it, it acts as a laxative. So the bird will have free motions, uh, nothing to be worried about. Another very nice thing that uh, you can do is when you have uh, birds, uh, we use cheap plywood, uh, plywood to make nest boxes because uh, if I talk about conservation and then I cut down 200 trees to make nest boxes, it doesn't really convert to, to uh, conservation, right? So we use cheap plywood boxes, which we use for one year and later we tie it into the forest. You know, we put it up in some uh, trees, either in our farm or in the forest or wherever, where some uh, honeybees might form, form a hive some rodents might breed, some snakes might uh, take rest, things like that. So, um, but then uh, uh, if you are using uh, natural wood as nest for nest boxes, I would suggest flame the nest box inside. Uh, like put fire and flame the thing inside. Because the first thing is the dark sooty color makes the bird feel very comfortable sitting inside. This um oh, this uh, charcoal does not allow uh, i mean mites don't uh, reside in this in the crevices um, so it's a natural anti anti tick treatment and even if the bird tends to chew on that uh, residual charcoal it uh, it acts as a good chelating agent so that's about heavy metal poisoning thank you sir there's another question so yes. someone's asking about uh, budgies. So they're asking mm -hmm. if it's okay to feed cuttlefish 
that's uh, brought in for minerals and they're asking mm. them how, how much can you feed the cuttlefish for the budgies there's a question right yes so uh, i'll answer this uh, i have very strong opinions about uh, not using uh, cuttlefish bone because it's not a natural product the bird never has access no bird in nature would have ever eaten a cuttlefish bone okay because cuttle it comes from a cuttlefish right i mean and it's generally dead and decaying uh, i mean when the cuttlefish is dead uh, the bones kind of uh, wash up onto the shore so it's been through a decaying animal and most of these cuttlefish uh, bones if you uh, during rainy season you will see a lot of black mold growing on it so there's a great chance that you are going to uh, infect your birds with a lot of fungal infection uh, so ideally what you should do is if you get cuttlefish bone uh, you microwave it for it you wash it properly thoroughly first uh, and then you microwave it and then pressure cook it as what they say but more importantly it's only for the calcium that you're doing it i would rather give it uh, uh, a phytocalcium uh, supplement like uh, drumstick leaves or if your bird is not eating drumstick leaves you could just uh, if you have a drumstick plant you just uh, chop off some of the leaves uh, dry them in the shade by next day all the leaves would have fallen down and the twigs will come away okay so you just dry them in the shade itself within one or two days it will become you you get the leaves crush it into a powder and store it you just sprinkle this uh, um, this powder onto whatever your bird seed so i strongly um work i am kind of vehement about uh, um i vehemently oppose people using cuttlefish bone i don't think it is uh, a good thing to do similarly there are people who also feed uh, that um what do you call that himalayan rock salt the pink salt right so i don't know if uh, a lot of people still do it but there was a time in hyderabad where every breeder would have one stone of that rock salt put inside so i would ask them why are they doing that they say oh no no you see there was one video of uh, birds licking salt or clay licks in uh, amazon river basin so i said the amazon river basin they eat mud this is salt and they eat a lot of different uh, toxic material and that acts as a detox and why are we giving this they said but see how beautifully that bird is eating that salt and it had genuinely i mean the rock the salt was that big it had become that much because it has eaten you can see the uh, concave uh, structure in the salt rock so uh i asked i asked him so he told me see how beautiful it is eating it i said if you give a 10 year old kid ganja no he will also smoke it with with a lot of passion but that does not mean that it's good for him you give him a ton of weed he'll still keep going for it but that does not mean that it is right so just because the bird is eating it does not make it right there should be a certain amount of questioning that should happen before we feed our birds yeah any more question yes sir there's another question uh how often can you feed insects to aviary birds okay so uh it depends on what species is it like for example if it is conures you don't need to feed them any animal protein but a uh, few birds like grays and uh, macaws and cockatoos also tend to have uh, a liking for uh, for insects but that does not mean uh, that uh, you provide them uh, or any random insect because you do not know the toxicity level or whether that that species is edible by the bird or not one of the safe species are cockroaches uh, mealworms and superworms and i and wax worms and things like that are also there but they are very difficult to source because wax worms tend to burrow through wood and things like that and it's a gently a menace if you have them so you have dubia roaches you have uh, um, hissing cockroaches you have uh, mealworms superworms things like that but my my suggestion is uh, if you can uh, you do not know the the biggest fear of uh, feeding insects is you don't know on what substrate have they been grown because if they grown on oatmeal oatmeal also tends to catch fungus very very fast so uh, we used to grow our uh, insects on uh, rice bran and wheat bran no 
and we were very successful at that but you know, when we feed our uh, our birds we would still kill the insect and give because at times if they ingest the insect they can actually bore through the gut the the, the lining of the neck and things that and come out or even from the esophagus and things that so i would strongly suggest or uh, if you if you can just provide them with chicken and things like that you know as a protein source that's a better option because uh, african grays for example in africa tend to eat snails but snails are also they have huge parasitic load if i'm not mistaken so um, what they do in the wild is very different because they have it's like a man who lives in the village is much stronger than a fat bald guy like me sitting in a city you know i can't mimic his lifestyle and expect to survive another day you know i can't run for more than 10 feet so i can't expect uh, my bird to do something like that also so i would rather suggest if you want to give them animal protein give them something like chicken or uh, something like mutton or something like that you know uh, i think that's a safer thing to do human grade basically thank you sir so there is one more question uh, what are the precautions you can take when snakes are molting um uh, there's actually nothing that you need to do uh, in fact uh, uh, the only precaution that i would take is not stick my finger too much close i mean if i if i handle birds and things like that or rats and things like that uh, or rodents basically i would not want to stick my hand very close to the snake because the smell might uh, instigate it to bite so though some of them have heat sensing pits and things like that but still it might just if it's hungry it might mistake my hand to be a rodent so that's the only fear that i would have but otherwise it's very very simple i mean there's no you can do a potassium permanganate wash once in a while and things like that but uh, i personally don't do it i've heard people talk about it i just uh, wash my snakes with i put a little bit of vircon in the water vircon is and you no know, let them swim around for i mean like in a small bucket not we don't have like a bath you know, swimming pool sort of thing we just have a small bucket in which we put the snakes for about 2 minutes uh, so that if this it's a general disinfectant then we leave them out to bask in the sun and once we feel that they're active and they are uh, you know they that they can uh, that their uh, the body temperature is come to a good uh, uh, to a point where they can hunt and eat quickly we f- start feeding them rats and that also we uh, that's another thing that uh, in rodents um, people tend to overfeed them also they tend to feed them once in two three days and things like that we feed our snakes uh, two i mean now they are almost full grown so we feed them two rats during summer once a week that's weekly two rats at one shot we provide the biggest possible rats so that the the elasticity of the muscle is alive if you keep giving them small feeds what will happen is the elasticity is not enough so when they're eating the snake the rat it only opens up them but if i uh, mice it's only that much if they if i can give them a rat which is that big it has to completely open up and then you can see the the muscle stretch you know so we try to exercise that part of it but during winters we don't feed them at all for about 2 or 3 months because uh, the metabolism is slow uh, if you still have to feed the snake because if you think it's weak then you you need to give it a heat source at the bottom okay you so your enclosure should be sitting on a heat source if it's a big enclosure you provide a wooden box with bulbs inside if it's a small uh, uh box in which you are keeping your snake you put it on a heat pad mm, sorry so what happens is uh, you should you should understand that the bird that the animal is uh, uh, is a cold blooded animal and uh, during winter it has got uh, um, almost no capacity to i mean the the dead body of the rat is decaying very very slowly and more than digestion it's decaying faster inside so it takes uh, during summer about 2 days for it to defecate the rat out but during winters it can take as much as 10 days for it to defecate it out so when it's when there's a dead body inside for for 10 days it's not a very good thing so i think more more precaution should be taken in terms of diet than in terms of uh, when they're molting molting you just take care that you don't touch it after touching a rat 
Okay. Thank you, sir. So yeah. I think these were all the questions we had. Okay. Um, Thank you, sir, for this amazing lecture. And uh -huh. it, it surely has helped us a lot, improving our knowledge and information about the welfare part and management part of the exotic animals. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's been lovely uh, you know, interacting with you. And uh, again, if anybody has any doubt, you can always get back to me on my WhatsApp. Uh, the number is 988-5222-974. It's just that don't call me at 10, 12 in the night. Uh, you know, because I don't know, a lot of people are active during that time. So, <laughs> you know, you can just send me a WhatsApp and I'll reply back. Yeah. Thank you so okay, much. Sir. So on behalf of everyone at AVSA India and the animal welfare team, I would like to express my gratitude for making this webinar a huge success. First of all, I would like to thank our speaker, Nanda Kishore sir, who despite being busy in his schedule, is taking time to educate us with his interesting knowledge and all the things you told about the home remedies and all we can use. Thank you, sir, for being part of this event. We are grateful for all the enthusiastic participation, both in Telegram group and webinar for joining us. This event wouldn't have been possible without you all. Last but not the least, I would like to express my heartfelt thanks to my animal welfare team, without whom this event wouldn't have been possible. And these are the ones who are helping me with everything that's going on with the events. So thank you guys. And thank you, sir, once again for being part of this. Thank you. All the best. Bye-bye. Thank you, sir.